Hello, everyone. Daniel Feruzin, host of the Schmoozin' with Feruzin podcast. Very excited about today's episode. We're getting into an area of law that, frankly, I know nothing about. I know that a lot of people are actually curious about this area of the law. I know a lot of women, a lot of female friends of mine have talked about freezing their eggs and stuff like that. So I thought it would be really interesting to have attorney Ellie Javadi on here. She is an attorney who practices fertility law and can probably answer a lot of my questions as well as any of the questions you might have. Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, good. I'm happy to hear that. I, I, I'm going to start, you know, I, I like to usually jump into the juicy stuff, but I actually want to go over some of your background first, because look, when I went to law school, it's like, so are you doing personal injury? Are you doing business? Are you doing employment? Uh, where did fertility law come from and how did you get involved with that? Sure. And I think that's a completely appropriate question to ask about this area of law. And my experience has been that 90% of the people who are in this field that I'm in, whether it's um, mental health professionals, attorneys, et cetera, whoever's involved somehow has a personal tie um, to this field. And so it's completely appropriate that you would wanna know how the heck did you even get into this? Um, so after law school, I went similar path as you, I was actually a litigator. And um, at the time, um, my husband and I were trying to start a family like most young couples and things weren't happening the way they were supposed to happen. And we were recommended to a fertility doctor. Mm. And so we went that route. Uh, long story short, it took a very long time and it took many different procedures and fertility treatment um, to get us pregnant um, and to achieve our dreams of becoming parents. Um, throughout that process, I met other women in support groups. Now, wow. and I don't mean to age myself, but back then there were no Facebook groups. There were no, you know, virtual support groups. Everything was in person back then. And so I found some in-person support groups. Um, I found that most of my friends didn't understand what I was going through. They were all, it felt like everyone was getting pregnant left and right and nobody else understood what I was going through. So I found an in-person support group in that group, mm -hmm. there were other women who were going through fertility, but their um, journeys were in different, you know, parts and paths. And some of them needed uh, legal documents. Mm -hmm. And they, they asked me, they're like, Ellie, you're the, you know, resident attorney in our little group. Can you do this for me? And that's when I had this moment of, you know what, I've been looking for something that I can really connect with, something mm -hmm. that I'm passionate about. Um, I wasn't really, to be honest, happy in the litigation world, no offense to you, you know, but it just wasn't my thing. And so it piqued my interest and I, you know, I was a young attorney and jumped head in, left my law firm, left my salary and decided I'm going to go do this solo. And so I did. And that same year, so I started my solo practice uh, and at the same time, I conceived my daughter um, with a frozen embryo. Okay. So it all kind of happened together. And that's what led me to the fertility world. And I haven't looked back since. Um, and I've been practicing for over 10 years in this area now. Well, let me just say first, congratulations on everything, on your career, on the path that you, you took to get there, on you know successfully having your child through this process and all that. I think that that's so wonderful. It's so special. Let me point out, you're definitely not the first person to tell me they left litigation. I, I get that all the time. It's a, it's a stressful area of the law. And, and, you know, I'm always so happy when people figure out the niche that is for them. And it pleases my heart to hear that, hey, you experience something and you harness that experience and you turn that experience, that passion, that fervor into an actual career. And, you, I, you know, you hung up your own shingles. So good for you. I think that's, I think that's great. Um, it is interesting just because so rarely, and of course I'm, I'm a guy, so maybe I have less to do with this than someone else, but so rarely do I have the pleasure of speaking with someone like you and to, to pick your brain a little, I'm so curious. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm going to assume, please feel free to consistently correct me where I'm wrong during this <laughs> podcast, but I'm going to assume that a lot of what you're doing involves surrogacy, the freezing of eggs and things like that. I wanted to ask you specifically about surrogacy, 
Can you describe the process? Yeah, of course. So uh, most of my practice is surrogacy. So you're right. And um, there's two different types of surrogacy. There's a traditional, what we call traditional surrogacy. And that's less common these days. And mm. traditional surrogacy involves um, someone who is not only carrying the child, but also their egg. So their genetics is also involved. Mm. So you're essentially um, using sperm, right? from whoever the intended father is mm -hmm. and you're fertilizing the egg getting the surrogate pregnant so that's called traditional surrogacy and then in the end it becomes the parent's child so that's traditional i rarely take those types of cases they're less common um they're super you know unique and special and it has to be handled the right way um the vast majority of surrogacies in the united states are what we call gestational surrogacy. So mm. the surrogate is gestating, but it's not their genetics. Mm. It's, it's completely somebody else's egg, which is the genetic component of the female, right? And, and the sperm for the male. And, um, and of course, you know, we have um, differences now with, you know, fluidity and gender. So all of that has changed and flipped too with what we, you know, what we're calling it. And we're trying to adjust in the fertility world too. Um, but typically a gestational carrier is carrying the pregnancy that is not related to the child at all. Does oh, that make sense? It does. So traditionally it was the surrogate was the person whose egg was used and the father is a person whose sperm, whereas the more contemporary version, the, the, the client's mother and the client uh, husband, the, the, the father who's going to support, provide the sperm, they provide those materials. And then is that done in vitro or something before it's implanted? Okay. So mechanically, it was much easier to do traditional surrogacy um, yeah. back in the day, right? So um, as you can imagine, if there was a couple and they were not able to conceive, then they could just use the sperm and inseminate another woman and she would get pregnant and carry their child for them, right? And then it would be their child. Um, but as we've advanced in technology and there's in vitro fertilization involved, right? You can, you can actually use the woman's egg. You can use um, the male sperm, fertilize it in a lab put it into a surrogate and, and the surrogate hopefully gets pregnant and um, carries to term. And then when the surrogate delivers, the parents uh, are on the birth certificate in the state of California. Okay. Now, I just want to make one correction. It's not always a man and a woman who are using a surrogate. So as you can imagine, they're same sex couples who mm. want to become parents and they clearly don't have a uterus to complete that process. And so they might have an egg donor, mm -hmm. right? And they create embryos for, with an egg donor. And then they then transfer those embryos to a surrogate and then have a family. Okay. Oh, that's a, it's, it's, this is a, such an interesting area of law to me. Right. You said that in the state of California, mm -hmm. um, the, the people using the service would be put on the certificate. Is that not the case outside the state? Can you tell us about that? Right. So, you know, all of us lawyers, as you can imagine, you know this, the disclaimer is I'm licensed and barred in the state of California. And this is, we're operating under state law. This is okay. not federal. And so every state has different, different laws and statutes and case law, in fact. So there are um, states, for example, where surrogacy is criminal. Paid surrogacy is criminal. You can only um, have a surrogate if the surrogate is doing it altruistically for no, no compensation, like okay. a family member or a friend. Um, in the state of New York, it was illegal, right? So you could not pay a surrogate to um, carry for you, it couldn't be compensated. You could only do what they call altruistic or compassionate surrogacy. Mm -hmm. They just changed their laws as of last year. So now New York is wow. changing. So other states have different laws. California is very surrogacy friendly. And we, we have a family code section that's devoted to surrogacy. Mm. And so a lot of um, people from other states and other countries, even internationally, 
come to California for surrogacy. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Do you have a lot of clients that are from outside of the state? Is that part of your practice? I do. Yes, I do have clients that are from other states. um, And I have tons of clients that are um, international too. If you don't mind me asking, and I'm not trying to get into the magic sauce, but how do you go about soliciting clients internationally or or out of state? I know a lot of what I do is is referral based, but it's based on a local network. How do you do it? It's referral based. Exactly. Um, A lot of it is referral based. So I'm not trying to hide the ball from anyone who's trying to get into this field. It's fertility clinics. Um, There are agencies that will match surrogates and intended parents. They do a ton of the legwork for parents. They'll screen the surrogate, they'll screen the intended parents and put people that really match together. Mm -hmm. Um, But it takes a lot of trust and experience. So they want to refer their patients to attorneys that are compassionate and who really know what they're doing, especially um, when they're international, because that can be royally messed up if you don't do it correctly. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Have, I, I don't mean to get into any attorney client privileged materials, but maybe do you have examples of case law or stories that are told in your industry, yeah. obviously, without saying the names? Yeah. I mean, I can just give you general examples. Um, you know, other countries have different laws, different ethical feelings about surrogacy. Um, in some countries, it's illegal to have a child if you're a sex, same sex couple, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and in other countries, it's illegal to go through surrogacy as well. And so, some countries, um, when so the goal is if they're international, they come here, they have their child via surrogacy, and then the goal is to go back home, right? So, mm-hmm. you want to make sure that you're not violating any laws of their home country. Um, And so it's really important that those people um, meet with attorneys in their country. Mm. Um, I'm not going to advise them as to what what is, you know, the the laws of their home country. And I I would hate to say, well, great, you have, you know, here's your child, here's your birth certificate, you know, everything's great in California. Um, But the goal is to be able to raise their family where they want to raise their family. And so if you go to an attorney who doesn't understand that layer of it um there could be hiccups when they want to go back home right if if things weren't done properly back home um that's one of the complications um that i've seen um you also you know when you have international couples you want to protect the the surrogate right so Mm -hmm. you want to make sure they have adequate funding in the escrow accounts Um, you want to make sure that the that the newborn is going to have health insurance um, there's other layers involved there. And so um, I know myself and a lot of the attorneys in this field, we get together and we just, we really try to raise the bar and ethically move forward. And I'm always mentoring others because I feel like if anyone makes a mistake, it just, you know, it has like a ripple effect. And I, I I just want everyone, we're talking about human life, right? We're talking about babies, not property or money. And so it's really important um, to do what's in the best interest of the child in the end of the day. So it can go royally, I mean, it can go wrong if if you don't consult with an attorney in the home country. This sounds extremely complicated. It it occurred to me, like when you started saying, I do this internationally, my brain starts saying international law, you have the state law, you have the law in the other country. There's, I'm sure, a degree of politics and culture that get Mm -hmm. intertwined in this whole thing. And then, you know, one thing that unfortunately I'm constantly reminded in in, in my career is there's people who are predatory and, and maybe that's part of surrogacy. Is that, are there people out there who have scams or frauds going on in this area? You know, I, I think that unfortunately the very tiny, tiny percentage that, um, that go that way is what gets in the media and gets attention. Um, you know, maybe I've been extremely lucky, but I haven't been involved in, in those types of cases. Um, most of my clients and most of the people that I work with, uh, are doing things for the right reasons. And, um, I haven't seen any predatory behavior 
with anyone that I've necessarily worked with, but they have come up. And um, one of the areas that, you know, people need to really be careful um, and protect themselves over is who's holding the money, mm. right? So we are attorneys, we have attorney client trust accounts, right? We report to the state bar. So we're regulated. We move a penny in the wrong way and, you know, we'd have to answer for it and be audited um, and sanctioned or disbarred. Uh, other entities don't have the same, right, licensing requirements, et cetera. Um, and so I think clients need to be really careful with where they're, where they're putting their money. Um, in the state of California, our statute says that either a client trust account or an escrow licensed and bonded escrow company has to hold the funds. But in the past, there have been entities that held the money and then it just, you know, disappeared. Oh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds rough. Yeah, it is rough, but I'll tell you the silver lining sure. is that the other attorneys and other people in the field usually rally oh. and help those clients out um, and, you know, make it, try to make it good. So is it, is it a small community in the fertility law practice? I think it's a pretty small community. Um, in California, it's fairly large in comparison to other states. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all pretty much know of each other or know each other. Um, I, I love working with the other attorneys on the other side um, and collaborating with them. And um, so most of us know each other. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to talk about donations and freezing as well. And we'll get to that. But I, I, something was just piquing my curiosity. By the way, this sounds extremely complicated, the whole process. And, and credit to you for doing this law. Uh, <clears throat> Before the law, or putting the law to the side for a second, the idea of doing an in vitro fertilization sounds incredibly complicated, at least to me. Clearly, I'm not a doctor. Um, and then if, if, if that's successful to then transfer it to the surrogate, is there a failure rate? Is, is there, how does that work? Um, are there things that lean towards success or is that something outside of your field to comment on? I mean, it is outside of my field in that, you know, I'm not a fertility clinic or a physician. And so I don't keep up to date with the statistics, but just as a person who's gone through fertility treatment, I can tell you that um, the success rates are largely dependent on the age of um, the egg. So whoever is going to be using, you know, the egg, whether you're, if you're using an egg donor, they're typically younger, um, women who are screened, right? And so they, there's hormones you can test so that you can determine fertility levels and, and make a really educated guess on how well things will progress. So egg donors are typically, you know, from 21 to 30 years old. Um, and so a woman's fertility, it's, you know, it's no secret declines after a certain age. And so that's what determines the success most of the time. Now, I want, um, there's, there's more than just, you know, fertility with, you know, heterosexual couples who are trying to conceive on their own. You know, um, there are, you know, cancer survivors, right? So they went through chemotherapy or whatnot. Maybe they froze their eggs before they went through that therapy. And so afterwards, they might try to have a child with, eggs that they retrieved prior to treatment. So there's, those are the situations that sometimes people aren't aware of. Um, and I work with those kinds of clients too. There's also, you know, people who have medical conditions where they physically cannot carry there, there isn't an issue with the egg quality, but they can't carry. Right. And then you have the same sex couples who will need an egg donor and typically the egg donors are young. So those success rates, are pretty high, mm. right? Because they're going with an egg donor. So you'll see that, you know, it's like a curve and then it just kind of declines based on age. Um, so those are the success rates. My number one tip to any, you know, women who are thinking about either freezing their eggs or going through in vitro um, with a partner is to make sure that you look up the clinic that you're going to and find out what their live birth rate is. 
Mm. And they will chart it. They will say by age what the live birth rate is, and, and they'll give you um, stats on whether or not an egg donor was involved. So that really tells you, you know, the quality of their lab, as well as um, how great the clinic is. So I would interview a few different clinics and find out what their stats are. They, they produce them and um, make an educated decision with who you're going to seek treatment from. Um, so egg donation, high success rate, when you're using your own eggs and you're sort of on the lower um, you know, part of the curve, then the success rates start to decline a bit. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And um, this is my non-medical, obviously, <laughs> physician. I'm not a doctor advice. Of course. Of course. Let me ask you about surrogacy before we move on to donation. Yeah. California law. <clears throat> I assume there's regulations and protections in place for both the, the parents as well as a surrogate. Is that how that works? So in California, in the family code, there is a section devoted to surrogacy um, and it talks about assisted reproduction. So mm -hmm. assisted reproduction is when you need assistance with reproduction and um, it, it outlines exactly what you need to do in order to receive a judgment declaring you the legal parent and declaring the surrogate as not responsible, right? Legally, financially, any which way possible. Mm. So really the best way to protect both sides is to follow the family code. And the family code also, it says each side should have their own separate attorney. Um, you know, they should go over the legal agreement before they ever start any, you know, medical treatment. So it's very straightforward and tells you exactly what to do. And these are all safeguards. This is to protect both sides. Um, so a lot of people don't want to involve attorneys. They feel like it's such a personal matter, but that's like the one place that you should spend your money on is making sure that the legal agreement between the surrogate and the intended parents is negotiated in good faith. Each side has their own separate attorney and um, it has to be signed and notarized. Oh. Right. So there's a notary requirement as well. And clinics typically, I mean, I haven't worked with any that won't. Um, I mean, they all require it. They want a letter from the attorney that says both sides have reviewed the contract. Both sides had their own separate attorney. Everybody is signed. I am clearing them legally to move forward before they do any medical treatment. And so this really protects both sides legally. Let me ask you a question. What if there's a situation where one of the two sides can't afford an attorney? Let's say the surrogate can't afford an attorney. Is there a fee shifting provision or something like that? So typically the, the parent uh, covers the surrogate's legal fee. Okay, that, that's what I figured it would be. And that, that fee, and that would be part of the contract that the parents are covering that. And 100% disclosed, you know, potential conflict of interest, all of that. Okay, uh, that's fine. So that's, that's how, let's say someone decides, hey, I want to have a surrogate pregnancy. Um, what's the time frame from, from the decision to the actual birth? Uh, you know, from being matched together to birth, it could take up to two years. Um, it just depends. I mean, with COVID, everything shut down for so long because of you know, the, the clinics and everyone sort of being afraid to move forward, um, people's own, you know, health at stake. Um, so it just depends. The surrogate has to go through a medical screening to make sure that she, you know, doesn't have any medical issues that we're not putting extra burden on her. There isn't anything new that has developed in her body, right? We don't want to give her extra risk. Um, and we also want to, for the intended parents, they want to make sure that she can carry, right? Mm. Um, they do meet with a mental health professional to discuss, you know, all the risks, uh, psychologically mental health professional has to clear them. Okay. They have to match and be on the same page. Then they have to do the medical procedure and hopefully get pregnant. So I, I mean, it can take anywhere from 18 months, two years, sometimes longer. Okay. So it's a timely process. It's not, it is. Yeah. I mean, the pregnancy itself is going to take, you know, 
10 months of that. So, um, you know, leading up to it, legal contracts, mental health professional, medical screening, matching. So that can all take, you know, another six to eight months. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think we spent quite a bit of time chatting about surrogacy, but I know that's not all you do. I know that you do donations and they are sperm donations, egg donations, and embryo donations. Could you specify all three of those for us? Sure. So um, egg donation is um, OVA, right? So if, if someone wants to have a child and they either, you know, genetically can't because of egg quality or they don't produce eggs, male, um, you can work with an egg donor. So um, a lot of women will donate their eggs to other people or couples so that they can have a child. They don't have any legal rights whatsoever to any future children from the donation. And then sperm donation is exactly the same, you know, but that's been, you know, we've had that forever, right? You go to a sperm bank, you donate, it's not the same thing, right? Um, there's no medical procedures involved, whereas egg donation, there is, it's a medical procedure. Um, sperm donation has been going on, you know, since, I don't know, the fifties, probably, um, egg donation, I would say is much newer, maybe, you know, in the last 35 or so 40 years. Um, and then embryo donation is let's say a couple creates embryos. So they create embryos through in vitro, right? So I did that. I went through in vitro. You use your embryos to try to have a family. Mm. And let's say, you know, me, Ellie, I decided I only want to have two kids and I have 15 embryos and I use five of them trying and I have my two kids and I have 10 embryos left and they're mm. frozen. So I could choose to donate those embryos to somebody else who might be going through something I'm going through, who wants to have a family, but they're experiencing fertility or you know, an individual who wants to have a family on their own or a same-sex couple. So I could technically donate my embryos to somebody else as long as I have the rights to them, right? So some egg donors, when they donate, will say, I'm only donating to you, Ellie. I don't want you to ever mm. donate to somebody else. Okay. And so that's part of what is negotiated in the contracts. Interesting. Okay, very interesting. So- and you can't exchange money for that, by the way. I'm sorry? You can't exchange money for embryo donation. Wow, okay, very interesting. So egg, egg and sperm donations are, are arguably similar, but- what I'm interested in is something that you mentioned. It looks like there's a lot more paperwork for the egg donations and the sperm donations. Right. Um, when did the egg donation stuff come to fruition and, and why is it more complicated? So egg donation is more complicated because uh, the female has to take hormone injections oh, okay. for several weeks. So shots of hormones into her body um, her ovaries grow multiple eggs at a time. It's super uncomfortable. Um, mm. And there are risks involved, right? You're using hormones um, and you might have side effects. For example, you, you know, might not feel well. And then you have to go through a medical procedure where you are um, not completely put under. It's not general anesthesia, but it's like the twilight type. Mm -hmm. And then the physician has to actually retrieve the eggs. Okay. So it's, it's much more involved. There's more risk involved to the body. Okay. Got it. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to see yeah. what you had to say about it. it. It is my, my mind is going in so many different directions. Just <laughs> I know, I'm it, sorry. No, no, no. I think it's really interesting. I was especially interested when you said that if there is a donation of of eggs, there's almost like a, a and I, don't, I don't mean to objectify embryos, but there's almost a contract law or a property law aspect of it, which is you can donate them. It can't be for money. And you only, and the only people who can use them for fertilization purposes are the people who you gave them to. It's not like they can go and, and resell it to a third party. No, no. So, and that's what the agreements that we negotiate and go over with our clients and make sure they completely understand what rights they have and what obligations they have to these embryos, right? 
Um, it crosses over with other areas of law, as you can imagine, it can cross over with estate planning, mm -hmm. right? So you have leftover embryos, what happens to them? Is it part of your estate? Is it not? Yeah. Um, you, family law, right? People have these embryos and then they get divorced and then they're fighting over embryos, possibly if wow. there isn't the clear, you know, consent forms. Um, it crosses over with, you know, immigration, if you have international clients. So there are different areas of law that it can touch on. Employment law, if your surrogate is pregnant and she's uh, discriminated against. So, you know, it there are multiple layers. What, let me ask you this. In terms of sperm donation, um, it never sounded all that complicated. I, you know, you yeah. don't know of sperm banks existing. Um, yeah. in, in terms of egg donations, what is, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but where do the majority of the eggs or the embryos get donated or why, what's the cause of the majority of them being donated? Being donated initially to another couple or a person, you mean? Ver yes. I mean, what, because I, I, I know, again, with sperm banks, I understand a guy goes, he gets paid for the process, I believe, donates his sperm. It's, it's, it's okay. But in so far, and, and, and I'm assuming the men are doing this because they get paid to do it. Yeah. Um, what is, whereas the, the finances is, is the motivation for these men donating their sperm, maybe they have other uh, motivations as well, but what is the motivation for women to donate their eggs or their embryos? So many egg donors um, donate their eggs for, you know, they want to help another family out. They understand they may have had someone in their family that, you know, they know about that had an issue. Um, they maybe they, you know, don't think that um, that that they want to give back in some way. Um, and this is their way to give back. But they are also they are financially compensated for their pain and suffering. So for taking those shots and for going through the egg retrieval process, mm. they don't get paid for the number of eggs that they produce. So it has nothing to do with quality or quantity of the eggs, but they get paid for just going through the process itself and taking the risk. Um, so they get reimbursed for that. Okay, let me so ask that's you- the motivation, sorry. L l let me ask you this. And I, I'm, I'm, please don't quote me on this, but I remember my friend was telling me something about a, a sperm donor who was found to be the father of the eventual child. It might not have been in the state of California. Frankly, it might not be true at all. I'm not sure I'm going into my deep memory here. Do you know anything about this where someone donates and then later by some mechanic of the law becomes the actual parent of the child? Uh, so... If you were to donate to a sperm bank, okay, you there's consent forms that you sign and waivers that you sign with the sperm bank. And typically that sample is given to someone that you don't know, it's anonymous, right? So you wouldn't be found to be the parent of that child. Hmm. Uh, we have a statute in California, it says, if you donate sperm to someone who is not your partner or spouse, you're not considered, and you go through a sperm bank, you're not considered the parent, hmm. flat out, there's a statute. In some situations, people know each other, right? So we call it known sperm donors, right? So they're donating to somebody who is their friend, for example. And in the beginning, maybe they decide, yeah, this is a, I'm just donating. But then if you hold yourself out to be the father, if you start behaving like a father in those first few years of a child's life, and that child believes you to be the father, I mean, it, it's in the family code as well, right? Um, and so in those circumstances, you may be held out to be the father. So you act like the father, you hold the child out to be your own, you take the child into your home, um, you know, the child calls you dad, <laughs> um, you support the child financially, you know, all of these things point to, okay, you're not just a donor, you're actually a father. And the reason why the courts would find that person a father is only if it's in the best interest of the child, mm. right? It's always family law is what's in the best interest of the child. And in those situations, if you're behaving like one, acting like one, then that's that's the only way you would really be held to it. 
Uh, most of the time with sperm donations, there's an agreement between the parties. They discuss what their relationship is going to look like. They discuss, you know, what kind of interactions they're going to have. And it's all laid out and very clear. And if you follow all of those um, intentions, you're, you're not going to be held to be the father. I, I can appreciate if a donor begins acting like the, the father, begins acting like a parent, that the law might find them to be the parent. Is there a situation where the donor is anonymous, is uninvolved, but nonetheless can be found to be the child's parent? Not in California, no. Okay. No. Okay. Maybe that's yeah. the rumor I heard. Yeah. No. And the only other really way is, you know, sometimes, I mean, if you have, you're donating, but you have sex, the law will not protect you. Like the minute sex is involved, it's not a donation. Uh, and so that's, that's like the number one rule. We, it's either has to go through a clinic or it has to be an insemination. It cannot happen through physical contact between the parties. Like if you have sex, the, the statue won't protect you. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, there's a donor and there's a surrogate and everything is clean and by the books. If they happen to become intimate at that point, the law would not allow it. Okay, and that's understandable. Okay, fair enough. Let me ask you, let's say someone, a woman is deciding or a man is deciding to go through the process of donations. Um, what would you say they should know before they go about it? Before becoming an egg donor um, or a sperm donor, uh, I would definitely implore them to think about anonymity. Okay. Anonymity is, I, I don't believe it's a real thing. Mm. And so a lot of times you're donating confidentially or anonymously, but in the, in the age of DNA testing and genealogy and reverse Google imaging, and you just put in the college that the person went into and their name, and you can pretty much figure out who the person is. So if you're someone who really, really wants to stay private you don't want anyone to know that you're, you're donating your eggs or your sperm. That's probably not for you. Mm. Um, uh, you, you even if the child um, isn't looking for you and they just do a DNA test and someone in your family does a DNA test, you don't even do it. You're going to get connected. Mm. And a lot of surprises oh, have, yeah. you know, uncovered themselves. Um, through this DNA testing, you know, 23andMe and all of these other, you know, websites. And so my, my, I always tell people, even when I review contracts with them, I say, you realize that there is no real thing as anonymity. Mm -hmm. So you can do your best to be confidential, but it's, it's really false um, to, to think that that's, that's actually going to hold forever. Let me, that's interesting that you bring up the 23andMe. Has there, I know I've heard of, I, I think 23andMe even has a disclaimer that you have to sign through, which says you might find out that your parents aren't your biological parents. Yeah. Uh, surprises, as you put it. Um, does that involve your work ever? Do you get involved in a situation where someone learns that their biological parents are not who they thought they were? No, I don't, I don't usually have um, involvement in those types of situations. I do get calls from people who um, donated to another person or they received the donation, for example, and, you know, their child is now 10 or 12 and they're starting to think about the future of this child. And, and then they want to go back and say, you know, does this person want to consider talking to us and exchanging information, for example? Um, people have a change of heart on the confidentiality and the not anonymity. And I'll say most donors are open to um, sharing information on some mm -hmm. level um, and providing a background. And um, I'll get off my soapbox, but it's really important for these children, right? They're children and then they become people, they're adults and they wanna know their biological history, mm -hmm. right? We learn this through adoption. 
Remember when adoptions were all closed and secretive and then numerous psychologists came out with studies saying how it actually was detrimental to these children to not know their backgrounds and their history. And I believe that, you know, egg donation and sperm donation is similar. These children are grow up to be adults and they have feelings and they have opinions about it. And I think they should be heard. There's um, Facebook groups with tons of, you know, donor conceived people mm. and, um, they, you know, they, their recommendations are typically tell your children about the donation, about their procreation, tell them their story, tell them often mm -hmm. at an age appropriate time, obviously with language that they understand. Um, but yeah, so this, you know, there's ethical and moral obligations, I think on the parties who are practicing in this area to really tell their clients what's in the best interest of everybody in the long run. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Let me ask you, um, what about egg freezing? Is that something your office is involved in? And can you tell us about it? So I don't, you know, egg freezing is, um, there's no third party involved, right? So there's no conception involved. Um, I, I do sometimes um, help friends and others find clinics uh, to recommend to them for egg freezing. Um, you know, people are choosing to have families later in life. And sometimes even employers are willing to cover the costs. It's included in some benefit packages. Um, and so egg freezing, if you're going to do it, you know, make sure you do it with a clinic again, with really great rates, um, live birth rates, and, you know, really ask about how long you know they've been in practice their lab what quality lab do they have um but i don't normally get involved with those uh, the consent forms are signed at the clinic they don't typically involve a lawyer reviewing them okay okay um all right well I, look that was certainly <laughs> eye-opening for me um and, and and i hope you know i haven't at all been dense or insensitive uh, this is an area of law that's completely foreign to me. I have a feeling, Ellie, it's, it's completely foreign to a lot of people. I actually told several people that I was doing a podcast with someone who practices fertility law and that we all said, yeah, that's interesting. I wonder how that works. It's, yeah. you know, it's probably a lot of, a lot of red tape and, and, you know, legal stuff that you have to get through. And based on my conversation with you, it sounds like that's probably true. It does sound like a chewy area of the law. It is. Um, it's also extremely rewarding. Um, I get baby pictures oh. and updates and thank you letters. And those are the highlights um, of my, you know, career and job. And I love doing that. Um, and I, you know, I want to make sure that the area and the field um, that everyone understands that it's very inclusive. Um, it includes the LGBTQ community. It includes, you know, um, cancer survivors, um, you know, people have had horrible accidents and, you know, right. Also other people who, you know, are single parenting. So I, I want everyone to know this isn't just a heterosexual couple that is having trouble conceiving it. It's all over the board. And my practice especially is all inclusive. And I like to make everyone's dreams, you know, realized. If people want to find you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? So, I'm great um, with email. So my, the best way to find me is um, to email me, uh, E-L-L-I-E -L -L -E at J-A-V-A-D-I-L-A-W.com. So it's Ellie at javadilaw.com. Um, you can also just go to my website, uh, javadilaw.com and send me a note there as well. Um, those, that's probably the best way. I'm pretty good with responding to email. When people reach out to you internationally, do you get like a voicemail at three in the morning or something like that? Or how does that work? Uh, no, typically they email me. They find me on the web or, you know, they've been given my email address. And then, you know, was I've been Zooming and FaceTiming and doing all of this before COVID ever hit. Uh, I have clients even in the state of California that are in San Francisco or in San Diego. And so a large part of my practice was always virtual. Okay, well, you can welcome me to the club because a large part <laughs> of my practice is now virtual too. Right, but yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Sure. I always like to let people have whatever you want to say at the end if you have a message to the audience, anyone who's watching. 
Sure. I mean, I think um, I'd love to tell any um, law students who are out there and who are interested in this area. It's really lovely. Um, you are uh, practicing law. It's ever changing. So you have to adjust and learn. I'm constantly learning from my colleagues. It's very collaborative. Um, I love the people that I work with who are on the other side. And I get to help people have babies and um, it's, it's really lovely. So if you wanna get into this area, um, you feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk about my experience. Um, I know it's sometimes daunting cause it's a new and um, you don't have the California practice guides for fertility law. Oh. But if I can help in any way, um, I'm always happy to help. You help people have babies. That is yeah. so wonderful. and, and yeah. uh, what a wonderful thing to end the podcast on. Ellie, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been eye-opening. I've learned a lot today. I have a feeling that people listening are learning a thing or two as well. Uh, if you want to get in touch with her, we'll put the link to her website below. She already gave you her website's name. Shoot her an email. Ellie, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure.